Oh, wonderful. Greetings. We are now in lab eight. This is focusing on the appendicular muscles. Uh, we're focusing primarily on exercise 12. Now, the 13.6 would have been done if we get the opportunity and the resources and the time using a, a, a goinometer, which measures angles, um, but that may not be necessarily something that we're going to be able to really do. But I want to introduce you to that device to get an idea of how we have tools that medically analyze certain joint movements and their capacities. But first and foremost, let's get started. Now, what we're going to do is review the exercises 12.1 to 12.5. This is in the Saracus book, and you are going to complete the sheets at the end of the exercise which I've already uploaded onto the Blackboard. These worksheets, uh, which include pages 273, uh, 217 to 220, what you're going to do there is basically download the sheet, fill it out completely, save it as a PDF form, and then upload it, and it has to be uploaded and completed by 5 p.m. on the Friday. Now, as always, if you make a boo-boo, doesn't work out right, you make an error, everybody has that, but you have to get in the work by 5 p.m. Friday. You can re-upload that work if something happens, okay? As for the exercise 13.6 and the use of the guinometer uh, to perform various range of motion analysis, ROM, I'm going to introduce you to the concept, but you're not going to be able to do much, but I'm hoping that we have a video on that that we can help show you the, the uh, application. In all cases, you should be uh, reviewing the lab videos to help you in your comprehension of the objectives for this particular lab. So let's get started. Now, in this case, we're working on the appendicular muscles, so that really means we're going to be dealing with muscles that are going to be concerned not merely with the upper and lower limbs in the sense of hands, forearm, upper arm, but we have to consider all the structures that assist in the attachment of the uh, pectoral girdle and the stabilization of uh, basically the limbs around that pectoral girdle as well as the pelvic girdle and the upper leg lower leg, ankle, and of course the feet. Now you're going to notice some differences in the sense of size and mass, everything. Keep in mind, we're bipeds, we're not quadrupeds. So what you're going to see is some distinct differences um, based on the fact that you have a different range of motion between the shoulder, when you compare that with the, um, the, the hip, Okay, but you're also going to have to keep in mind that it is the lower legs that not only will help uh, stabilize the body mass, but they're going to be necessary for propulsion as opposed to just external limbs that you don't really walk on your, your uh, hands, you walk on your feet. So you have to uphold the weight, but also at the same time be able to propel yourself. You'll see some of these differences as we move along. The muscles of the shoulder include two groups, muscles that move the shoulder and muscles that move the arm. Muscles of the shoulder that move the scapula uh, include the anterior thoracic wall. Uh, these muscles will help stabilize the pectoral girdle doing movements at the shoulder. So the muscles there will include the pectoralis minor, subclavius, the serratus anterior, which keeps the scapula in position against the thoracic wall. The posterior muscles connect the scapula to the bones of the axial skeleton. These include the trapezius, levator, scapulae, rhomboid minor, and rhomboid major. And so you can see this. If you take a look here, muscles that position the pectoral girdle, trapezius over here, levator scapulae here, subclavius right here, 
Okay, so beneath sub the clavicle. And then the pectoralis minor, one, two, three, here. Notice they had to retract over this particular muscle mass here. We'll get into that in a minute. You'll notice also that there are, of course, the intercostals here, but the muscles that position the pectoral girdle also include the pectoralis minor, which we did some cutting this time here. And we have the serratus anterior, which have some embedding here with the ribs. Now, if we move from the anterior view to the posterior view, you can see the importance here. The muscles that position the pectoral girdle See this big wide mass here with large aponeurosis throughout here? That's the trapezius, so think of it as a trapezoid. Underneath this, now this is superficial, so when you cut away all of that, you get into the deep dissection, the muscles that position the pectoral girdle, the levator scapulae, the rhomboid minor, meaning it's the smaller rhomboid muscle, the larger rhomboid major is right here. And notice that they're attached. All three of these groups are attached to the edge of the scapula. And there we have the serratus anterior right over here. This is all providing stability for this particular bone. If you remember, I mentioned this earlier in the labs, this bone, the scapula, is not attached to the back of the, the uh, ribs. The only real attachment you have to the axial skeleton is via the scapula, and um, to the clavicle, and then eventually to the sternum. So how do we stabilize this large sheath here? It's through a lot of these muscles that we have, okay? Now, let's talk about the muscles of the shoulder that move the arm. The pectoralis major, which is a large superficial muscle that moves the arm in several planes. The latissimus dorsi, which connects the axial skeleton to the humerus, largest muscle that moves the arm. The teres major, smaller muscle, but also moves the arm. And then the deltoid muscle, which covers the shoulder joint, inserts at the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. Uh, it's involved with flexion and medial rotation of the arm, and it moves the arm anteriorly as in reaching forward or throwing a ball underhand. The lateral fibers abduct the arm by pulling the humerus toward the acrimonium. And then you have abduction of the arm resulting in the arm moving away from the body as it reaches out on the side. This is all done through the deltoid muscle. So let's take a look. Here's the deltoid right here. Here's the pectoralis major. Notice that it also is attached to the sternum as well as to the clavicle. The other muscles that move the arm, and this is in the deeper area, so we had to cut away the deltoid and the pectoralis to be able to view these. The subscapularis, which contributes to what we call the rotator cuff muscle. The coracobrachialis, which is right there and the teres major, which is right here. Notice that they're all attached to the upper part of the humerus. Now, muscles of the shoulder that move the arm, as I mentioned this term, rotator cuff muscles, everybody hears about it if you're listening to uh, news about a pitcher in baseball. And what you have to keep in mind is that remember that the shoulder and the humerus, they have a joint sort of like a ball and cup joint, but it's very shallow. The more you put um, forces into it, the more you risk damage to it. Now, the muscles connect the scapula to the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. So you've got the infraspinous, the supraspinatus, um, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. And you can see these here. So here is the supraspinatus. The infraspinatus is all here. The teres minor and the teres major. Okay. So moving on. Oh, by the way, here's on the back. I didn't get to mention it earlier, but here is the latissimus dorsi. Notice how wide it is. 
Now, muscles of the arm. These are divided into anterior compartments and posterior compartments. The anterior compartment muscles are flexors of the arm and the forearm. These include the biceps brachii, biceps by two. There's two heads, a long and a short one. The coracobrachialis and the brachialis. Now, the posterior compartment extends the arm and forearm. These include, of course, the triceps brachii, triceps tri three. There's three heads, long, lateral, and medial. Now, this is where it gets nice because you get a labeling of all the muscles that either act as extensors or flexors. So let's just look at this from the upper arm to the elbow first. Triceps brachii, you have the long head, the lateral head, and you've got a small stabilizer one called the anconeus right here. Okay, here's the oleocranon of the ulna. If we talk about flexors, we have to now consider the biceps brachii by, there's two, okay? This one attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula. You have the long head, the short head of the biceps brachii, the brachialis right here and here, and the brachioradialis, which is right here. You had to actually pull some of the muscle, notice this here, to actually view this here. Okay, now, I'm going to go over this right now, but I'll get into it a little more in detail. But here, you want to be mindful of the wrist extensors, which include the extensor carpi ulnaris, the extensor carpi radialis longus, right here, right here, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, meaning it's kind of short, brief, okay? And notice here, if we want to talk about the wrist flexors. These are on the underside, well, anatomically we would say, um, and you, these include the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor car carpi ulnaris right here. Okay? We'll get into pronators and supinators now, but you can see that these are important. Pronator terrace is right here. The supinator is right here. And then you've got the pronator quadrinus right here. Keep in mind the extensor reticulum and the flexor reticulum. I'm going to go into that in a minute or two. Now, muscles of the anterior forearm. They're divided into anterior compartments and posterior compartments. And the anterior compartment muscles are divided into superficial, intermediate, and deep layers. Superficial layer is common origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. These include pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Now there's an intermediate layer where you'll see the flexor digitorum superficialis. Then we have the deeper layer. That's the flexor digitorum profundus. Its insertion is at the distal phalanges of the medial four digits. The flexor pollicus longus, hint, pollux, is its insertion is of the distal phalanx of the pollux, the thumb. So if you see this, it's involving this, which is the thumb. And then, of course, the pronator quadratic, quadricus. And we've already mentioned some of these here. And... What I'm going to do is move forward quickly. There's a lot more here. As I've mentioned before, you want to be familiar with some of these terms. Carpi refers to carpal bones, the wrist joint. Pollicis refers to the thumb, the pollux. Now, this is where we get into the reticulums. There is an area called the carpal tunnel. It is a passageway for long tendons of the anterior compartment muscles that insert onto the hand. You have to keep in mind also that there's a medial nerve that passes through that carpal tunnel too. We have carpal bones, which form the anterior concave surface, sort of like the floor of the carpal tunnel. That brings us up to, hey, haven't I heard of carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah. This is due to repetitive motion. Now, repetitive motion used to be you'd get a lot on the assembly lines and things like that. You still do it where there's a lot of manual manipulation of things whether they're, they're um, basically 
butchering uh, pieces of meat in a meat processing plant or chicken or turkey processing plant. Basically, there's a lot of hand motion. It's usually repetitive, and you're doing it with a lot of speed. So what happens is it leads to inflammation and the swelling of that tendon. Now, it can be treated with anti-inflammatories, with rest, with surgery, being one who has had it. Basically, they can do certain things. One of the things is literally to take a needle, inject into the area where that tunnel is, and they may use lidocaine or cortisol or a combination of both. The idea being that it reduces the pain while the steroid reduces the inflammation. And then if not, surgery, which they would make small cuts onto the actual band of that uh, flexor reticulum and allow some expansion of this, and then it would relieve the problems. Here's what I mean. Think about it this way. Here is my roof of the flexor reticulum. Here are my carpal bones down here. Here are all of these uh, tendon sheets of the various structures that I mentioned. And then, of course, you've got the medial nerve. Now, you notice how tight it is in here? Not a lot of room. This is the basic space of the carpal tunnel. And though the bones may not have any effect per se, putting a lot of pressure on these tendon sheets, they tend to inf inflame and thereby swell that may actually affect the function of the medial nerve. Patients will report tingling, burning, uh, numbness in the fingers, etc. And that's where they will have to go in and treat this. Now, the posterior compartment is divided into superficial and deep compartments. The superficial layer has seven muscles. The echinos, uh, the extensor carpi ulnaris, the extensor digitum minimi, tells you it's short, minimal, the brachioradialis, the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, and the extensor digitorum. Now, the deep layer, so that's move away the superficial, go underneath, and wow, there's even more muscles here. There's the extensor indicus, the supinator, the extensor pollis longus, the abductor pollis longus, and the extensor pollis brevis. So, when you look at this, okay, so you can see the extensor digitorum, the extensor digiti minimi, the extensor carpi ulnaris, the flexor carpi ulnaris, the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, smaller one, the abductor pollis longus, the extensor pollis brevis, and the extensor pollis longus coming out through here. That's superficial. Pull them away. What do you got? Now you got the supinator here, the abductor pollis longus, the extensor pollis brevis, and the extensor pollis longus coming out through this area right in through here. You have also the extensor indicus, indicus there. Now, the Intrinsic muscles of the hand perform very detailed, fine motor skills. When I talk about lumbricals, these are very small muscles. The lumbrical term comes from really earthworm, lumbricus. There's four lumbricals in each, and you're going to have these travel through the palm of the hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Filling spaces between the metacarpal bones will be the palmar interossei, there's four of them. The dorsal interossei, again, four. The thenar eminence, which is a rounded mount at the base of the thumb, which acts exclusively on the thumb. Then you also have to deal with, of course, the flexor pollis brevis, the abductor pollis brevis, the adductor pollis, and the opponent's pollis. Now, the hypothenar eminence is a rounded mount of soft tissue, at the base of the little finger now. So keep in mind something. Thenar eminence, thumb. Hypothenar, hypo below the thenar, meaning tiny, little finger. 
basically the hypothenar eminence acts exclusively on the little finger. You also will have present there the flexor digiti minimi brevis, which is superficial, the abductor digiti minimi, which is superficial also, but then the opponent's digiti minimi is deep. And you'll see these here, okay? So you have the intrinsic muscles of the ham, the lumbricals, and you can see them right here and here, okay? You have also the palmar interosseus, the first docile interosseus, abductor digital minimi, flexor digi minimi brevis, opponents digital minimi, okay? The palmar brevis had to be cut because it covers over. But you can see the adductor pollis, flexor pollis brevis, the opponent pollis, the abductor pollis brevis here. Notice they had to actually pull some of this, the abductor pollis brevis, away so you could see underneath the opponent's pollis. Now, if you put the posterior view of the hand, by the way, notice all of these tendons, the extensor digitorum, okay? And you also notice these sort of um, you want to kind of consider them as like tendon sheets here. The intrinsic muscles are the first dorsal interosseus, the abductor digi minimi. Okay. And then, of course, here you have your extensor intaculum. Now, so far we've gotten through the entire upper limb. Now let's go to the lower limb. Muscles of the lower limb act on the hip the knee, the ankle joints, as well as the joints of the foot. The muscles of the gluteal region extend from the iliac crest superiorly to the inferior border of the gluteus maximus inferiorly. So the muscles are divided into a superficial and deep groups. This is going to be where there's a lot more muscle mass, or should be. Okay? So when we talk about superficial, all the important extensors, ab abductors, and rotators of the thigh are present. Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, all three make up the buttocks. Then we have the tensor fasce late. So you can see these here. Tensor fasce late right here. This is a iliotibial tract, which is more tendinous. You have the, underneath here, the glute gluteus minimus, gluteus maximus, and then underneath the sheathing here, you have the gluteus medius, which you can see better here. Okay? Moving on. Now, that was superficial. Now we're going to get into deep. The piriformis, which abducts the thigh. The superior gemellus, which laterally rotates the thigh. The obturator internus laterally rotates the thigh. The inferior gemellus laterally rotates the thigh. The quadraticus femoris laterally rotates the thigh. So all of these are important. Notice that we had to cut away all of this, the gluteal group, just about all of them, I should say. Remember the gluteus minimus is underneath the gluteus medius. Tensor fasce late is right here. Okay, so let's get into this, the lateral rotator group. Piriformis, superior gemellus, obturator internus, inferior gemellus, quadraticus femoris. We also, you'll see over here, this is that ischial tuberosity that we see. And the iliotibial tract is right here, right? Muscles of the anterior thigh originate in the abdominal pelvic cavity and insert in the anterior thigh. This is the iliopsis, which is formed from two separate muscles, the psoas major and the ilicus. Now the quadriceps femoris, this is the big group. Quadra means four, so keep this in mind what the four are consisting of. They cover nearly all anterior, lateral, and medial aspects of the femur, and they include the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, and the vastus intermedius. The sartorius is the most superficial muscle in the interior thigh. A little story about the sartorius once I go through it. So iliopsis group, this is the psoas major, right here, and the iliacus. 
the lateral rotator group. This would be the piriformis, which is attached from here, the sacrum, over to the edge and attached right to the, pe uh, the uh, femur. Now, the obturator internus is right over here, and the obturator in externus is right over here. They kind of cover both sides. You'll notice also that we have inguinal ligament from here to here. Okay. Ad adductor group includes the pectinus, the adductor brevis, the abductor longus, and the abductor magnus. Magnus meaning it's the biggest one. And then the gracilius, which is right over here. Now, this is where we, of course, had the gluteus medius, okay, the inguinal ligament, which I mentioned earlier, the iliopsis, which we've talked about. So let's go over to a couple of other ones. The tensor face latte, which is right over here. You have this iliotibial tract, the pectinus, the adductor longus, the gracilius is right here. Then we have the sartorius here, and by the way, the sartorius refers to is Taylor. Why? Because it used to be when tailors would work, they would sit down, cross their legs, and do their sewing. No joke. So a cut into the sartorius does not allow people to basically take their thigh and put it together in sort of a cross-legged approach. It makes it very difficult. The extensors of the knee include, here's the big quadriceps femoris group, the rectus femoris, which is right here. Now, you have the vastus intermedius, which lies deep to the rectus femoris, and the vastus lateralis, which is sort of down in here. The vastus lateralis is over here, so it would be lateral side of the body. The vastus medialis is sort of on the medial, on the end seam is what we would call it. Remember that we had the rectus femoris attached to the quadriceps tendon, which is then attached to the patella, which allows you to have the, when it contracts, it's going to allow for the extension of the lower leg, okay? Then we have, of course, the patellar ligament, which is then attached to the tibia. Muscles of the medial thigh, this is what we call the groin muscles. Most originate on the pubic bone or the ischium and insert along the posterior aspect of the femur. The function is basically synergous while walking and maintaining erect posture. The superficial muscles include the pectinus, the adductor longus, and the gracilius. Now, there are deep muscles all insert on the femur. The obturator externus, the adductor brevis, and the adductor magnus. So... Here we have this, as you can see, on one side, we got the, and now we have the posterior over there, and we have the abductor brevis, abductor longus, right up through here, okay? The abductor magnus, which really is a sheet that covers through here and then comes down to here and the gracilius up in here. Notice that they're all attaching to the femur right here, okay? Now the muscles of the posterior thigh, the hamstrings, the common origin is the ischial tuberosity. These include the biceps femoris, the semitendinous, the semimembranous. Now if you look at this, you're gonna find them. This is on the posterior view, so this is sort of like looking at the back. You can tell because here's the gluteus maximus here. Okay, we had the we talked about the adductor magnus, the gracilius, which is on the side here, the iliotibial tract on this side. Now we're going to look at the biceps femoris, which is these, the semitendinous, which is this, the semimembranous, which is this one that really is underneath the semitendinous, the sartorius, the lateral part of that is here, and the papillus, which is right over here. Remember that this is the knee joint. 
And we have to have certain stability here that's unique so that we can, yes, extend or flex it, but we don't want it going laterally or middle, medially. Now we're going to go into the muscles of the lower limb. This is the muscles of the anterior and lateral leg. This is divided into anterior, lateral, and posterior compartments. The anterior, the muscles originate on the tibia or fibula and insert on bones of the foot. These include the tibialis anterior, the extensor digitorum longus, and the extensor hallucis longus. Now, heads up, hallucis is referring to big toe, the hallux. Also, these tend to have very long tendons that travel through tunnels. The tunnels consist of floors, the distal part of the tibia and the fibula, uh, the interosseous membrane, and the tarsal bones. The roof consists of thick bands of connective tissue. This is where we're going to get the superior extensor reticulum, the inferior extensor reticulum. Okay, so let's go through this, okay? Here's our fibularis longus. Here is our in, uh, tibialis anterior. Here, of course, is it the tibial bone. It's a little hard to see, but there is the fibula down over in here. Uh, we have the extensor digitorum longus here. On the other side, we have the extensor hallucis longus. Now we have these two bands here. The superior is up here above almost the ankle, the extensor reticulum. The inferior one actually branches here and kind of covers over at the actual ankle and fold of the, from the leg to the foot. That's the ex inferior extensor reticulum. And then we got the tendon of the tibialis anterior right here. Okay? So if you look at this, this muscle comes all the way down here and flexes over. So it allows you to do things like flexing the foot, etc. Now the lateral compartment, this is muscles originate in the lateral side of the fibula and insert on the bones of the foot. So you have the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. Again, they have long tendons that travel through tunnels. These similar tunnels consist of the floors, which are the distal parts of the tibia and fibula, the interosseous membrane, and the tarsal bones. The roof consists of thick bands of connective tissue, and we've mentioned those before. You want to keep in mind the superior fibular reticulum and the inferior fibular reticulum. So here we are now. And we're looking on the lateral view. So this would be on the outside, not the inseam, but the outseam of the leg. Okay? So you have the iliotibial tract coming down here. The head of the fibula is right here. So we're going to get into this, the ankle extensors in a bit with the gastrocnemius here, the fibularis longus, the solus, which is buried underneath the gastrocnemius, and the fibularis brevis, which is right down here. The ankle flexors include the tibialis anterior. And here we have the extensor digitorum longus right here. The tendon of the extensor hallucis longus right over here. Why? Because the big toe is right there. The superior extensor reticulum is right here. This is the inferior extensor reticulum here. And we also have this calcaneal tendon. Guess what? It's also known as the Achilles tendon. Okay? There is a tendon over here of the fibularis teres, teretus. Now, when we do the posterior compartment, this is muscles. The muscles are seven muscles arranged in three layers. We're going to have superficial, intermediate, and deep. The superficial is the gastrocnemius, which I've kind of shown you before. So think about that, and then underneath it is another layer, the plantaris, the popoleus, and the solus. Underneath that is the deep area, which has long tendons that reach the foot through a bone tunnel and a, a thick band, sorry about the typo, thick band of connective tissue. This is the flexor reticulum. So those muscles, the deep muscles, are the tibialis posterior, the flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucis longus. So here we are. We're going to do superficial dissection first. Here is the plantaris. Here is the gastrocnemius. So it's got like two bellies on it. Okay? 
underneath it and we're going to cut it and pull it away. So we're going to cut it. By the way, this is the, what they call it, the calcaneal tendon. I told you that's the Achilles heel tendon because here's the Achilles heel right here, the calcaneus. Now, once we pulled away the gastrocnemius, you see this. The plantaris has this very thinner muscle and has a much longer tendon going all the way down. But here's the solus right here, and then we have the popliteus right here. Okay? Now, that's superficial. Let's go deep. What you find, here's our head of our fibula. You have this side and this side. You have the tibialis posterior. On this side, the fibularis longus, and then down here, you've got a smaller one, which is called the fibularis brevis, brief. That one way to think about it. The digitorum flexum, well, you've got the flexor digitorum longus, which is right in here. And then we have a side of that, the flexor hallucis longus, right here. And if you notice that entire network going all the way down here, all of these, when you get deep, you'll start seeing that all of this is all heavily tendons. When these muscles contract, that's when you curl your toes. When these muscles contract, that's when you can get up on your toes or walk on your heels or walk on your toes or whatever. But you'll notice that there's not a ton of muscles. There are some. We'll get into that in a minute. But the amount here is that when you have the phalanges down here, they're all being pulled by these tendons from muscles that are actually up in the lower part of the leg. So here you see this tendon of the flexor digitorum longus. Then you have the tendon of the fibularis brevis right here and the tendon of the fibularis longus right there. Okay. Now we get into the foot. The intrinsic foot muscles, they're arranged in four layers along the plantar surface. Okay. First layer, most superficial, fourth layer, deepest. Can, here's the other thing though. You might say to yourself, so what? Well, it's important because think about it. I can manipulate a quarter back and forth with my hand. I can do the OK symbol or any of these things with, with the fingers of my hand, but I can't do that with my toes. I can't do that with my foot. OK? You can't perform the fine motor skills of the foot like the hand. Now, the first layer of these foot muscles are the abductor hallucis, the abductor digi minimi, and the flexor digitorum brevis. Below that, we have the second layer, which is the lumbricals. Remember, those were the type that you also saw in the hand. They're small. They're kind of cylindrical. You also have the quadricus plantae. Then we get to the third layer, which is the flexor hallucis brevis and the flexor digiti minimi brevis and the adductor hallucis. Now, the fourth layer, this fills in spaces between the metatarsal bones. That's where the, 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 how can I say it, the meat of the foot is, remember? The metatarsals, and then we get to the toe bones, which are really the phalanges. In there, in this fourth layer spacing, uh, you're going to have the dorsal interossi. Notice there's four of them. And then the plantar interossi, and there's three of them. So let's look at this. Superficial muscles of the sole of the foot, Okay. And you look here, you see all these fibrous tendon sheets here. You see the lumbricals. You see the flexor hallucis brevis, the flexor digiti minimi brevis, right there. The abductor hallucis. The flexor digitorum brevis. Notice how this kind of like reaches out here. And the abductor digiti minimi. Now, by the way, this is as if you're looking up on the on the top of the uh, on the bottom of the foot, okay? Because the plantar aponeurosis, and you have the calcaneus right here, okay? Now, deep muscles of the sole of the foot, a little bit different, a little bit the same. Tendons of the flexor digitorum brevis here, here, here. It's three of them. 
tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. Hallucis, remember, big toe all the way here. Tendon of the flexor uh, digitorum longus right here. Tendon of the tibialis posterior is right here. And tendon of the fibularis longus is right here. Meantime, you've got the quadricus plane, the abductor hallucis, because it's deep, we had to pull away some of the surface muscles, okay? You had the flexor hallucis brevis, which you can see here and here, okay? You got all these lumbricals, boom, 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 boom. And then we get to uh, the flexor digitorum brevis, right down there. We had to cut some of that away. Uh, and then we finally had the plantar epineurosis and a calcaneus, the heel. Okay? Not to, men not to just mention the abductor digiti minimi. So we've gone through part of that, but let's go from the top down. Now we're not looking at the bottom of the sole. We're looking at the top of the foot. So let's talk about the intrinsic muscles. You'll notice also that we'll have the lateral malleolus of the fibula, the, in uh, the inferior extensor uh, reticulum. This is the one that I said kind of branches off as a Y. You have the superior extensor reticulum there. The medial malleolus of the tibia here. The tendon of the tibialis anterior comes right through here. And now we have the dorsal interossi. Okay. Here and here. The tendons of the extensor digitorum brevis, which are actually here here and here okay the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus are one two three and four and then we have the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus every time you see an hallucis and longus it only makes sense because it's got to be long because really there's the muscles farther up you're just pulling on this and all of this has limitations by these tendinous sheaths. So that's why you can't make your toe kind of stand straight up or anything. And if it's up there like that, something's broken. Okay? Something's amiss. Let's do surface anatomy for a minute. This is the study of internal structures in relationship to the features on the surface of the body. Now, there was problems with this because I was kind of like, uh, I don't think we're going to have people go over and palpate their neighbor. And you're probably smiling there and, and, and giggling. And yeah, you could do it yourself. Really what palpation is, is the feeling of the structures through the skin. Now, you've got shoulder muscles. You can follow the diagrams that you see in that uh, section. The anterior axillary fold, the posterior axillary fold, and determine what muscles are present. That helps. Muscles of the arm. Follow the diagrams and locate the biceps brachii, the triceps brachii, and the oleocranon. Muscles of the forearm, locate the muscle, muscles and fingers, the tendons to the muscles of the forearm, and locate the tendons uh, in the extended hand. Locate what's called the anatomical snuff box, sort of a little area pocket between the index finger and the thumb. Lo, uh, the lower limbs, and again, I keep saying this, do privately, do it yourself. Because when I started, I went up to my boss and said, uh, I don't know if I could see students, you know, kind of going over the gluteal region. And so these places, no, 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 we don't do that. But it would be helpful for you to get an idea by practicing on yourself and checking the gluteal region, the femoral triangle, locate structures on the anterior and medial thigh. Review surface anatomy of the leg and foot. Locate the calcaneal tendon, the lateral and medial malleolus. Now, this is where we get into this very brief part, um, which is muscle flexibility. And this gets us into the concept of range of motion of a select joint that can be examined. Um, this can happen if an individual has damage to muscle tissue, damage to the joint, has had atrophy of the muscle because of, let's say, a broken bone, and so the area has been put into a cast, and you've had atrophy of the muscle. Also, it's a great 
an important way to measure flexibility of joints uh, while the patient has some type of joint arthritis or other joint illness. The degree of flexibility really depends on the potential of both the muscles and tendons to lengthen when the movement occurs at the joint. Now there's two types of flexibility, static flexibility. The measure of the range of motion, ROM, without considering degree of difficulty in performing a, a movement. But we have the dynamic flexibility. This is the range of motion evaluated, but includes consideration of resistance to motion, as well as difficulty to pre perform uh, the motion. This is where you get into the goinometer, which measures static flexibility, it consists of two arms and a protractor-like measuring component. One arm is stationary, the other one moves. That's just like we've talked about before, origin and insertion. You know, you're going to move one as the muscle contracts, one bone will stay stable and not move. The other one will. Okay. You have a protractor like measuring component. Now, while the central portion, the protractor measuring device is placed over the joint like a fulcrum to measure the range of motion, the stationary arm remains at the original position, but the moving arm sweeps in the motion of the insertion and reflects the degrees of motion of the body part. The resultant angle formed by the two arms reflects the range of motion. Now, we don't have them right in front of you. As I said, I'll try to get a video to show you a little bit about that using a goinometer. But what I'd encourage you to do is think about that as you're looking over pages 230 and 231 in the Syracuse book. You do not have to do the exercise of table 13.3. And that's about it. Let's go over this. So you need to review the exercises 12.1, 12.15. Complete the pages of the handout, which you can download from the Blackboard site. These pages have already been set up so that you can immediately start putting information in, which these are pages 217, 220. You don't have to tear it out of your Syracuse lab book. You are to review the exercise 13.6 and at least go over some of the concept to understand it. In a allied health career, it is very conceivable that measuring range of motion, either static or dynamic, will be included, especially with certain patients who have um, joint illnesses or muscular atrophy, etc. You are to turn in those completed exercise sheets that are on the pages 217 to 220, but you're going to upload them at the Blackboard site. Do not give them to the instructor, okay? But you will upload those, and they have to be uploaded by Friday, 5 p.m. I would encourage you to review videos, which will show muscle, muscle models in relationship to the location in the skeleton, as well as movement for each muscle. Um, I would encourage you to review all the lab videos for this week, but also do some prep lab manual reading for next week's lab, as well as review the lab videos there. Well, we're done. Have a wonderful day.